Chinese house published by the National Museum of Singapore. In 2008, he produced Jung Jun Jio, The Things That Piranacans Value. Peter will explain to you what is Piranacan. It's very specific to Singapore culture. It's an exhibition and it has a lot for the Piranacan Museum. He co curated Salon Kebaya at the same museum, and a book he wrote on the, to on the topic, the subject, was published in 2014. 2018. This book was shortlisted for the Singapore History Prize. The 2013 exhibition inherited and salvaged family portraits from the AUS Museum of Straight Chinese Collections, comprised largely of portraits, paintings he had assembled. He also contributed an essay to the exhibition catalog that was published in 2015. In 2016, he co curated Singapore, Sarah Caravia, and Style in Tokyo. He was the guest curator of four cities, Multiwan and Podium of Asia, 15,000 to 19,000 at Asian Civilization Museum. Peter was also the guest curator of Hamek Kamba, Peranakan and Photography, an exhibition held at the Peranakan Museum from 2018 to 2019. He is now working on textile exhibitions to be held in Kuala Lumpur and Bangalore. Please welcome with me Peter Lee. Thank you, uh, Professor Pavi. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Singapore. I hear uh, many of you are, have just arrived. Um, um, I thought to firstly introduce myself. I come from what is called the Puranakan family. Over your time here, you might come across this term. Um, it refers to uh, communities of people from India, from China, who have been in Southeast Asia or this part of Singapore, Malaysia for the last few hundred years. A um, few hundred years ago, uh, during the Dutch colonial period, uh, in the port cities of Southeast Asia, women did not really travel. So whether you were European, Indian, Chinese, uh, you would find a local wife. And great port cities like Batavia, which is now Jakarta, which was like the New York of uh, the East at that time, um, had these incredible multiracial communities where everybody was mixed race. So whether you were so-called Dutch or Indian or Chinese, it was very likely, you know, you had a touch of uh, so-called Malay blood. Slavery was very rife from the 17th century. And all these rapacious merchants of the past uh, setting up businesses in Jakarta or what was then called Batavia, um, basically sometimes uh, maybe abused their slaves. There were a lot of slave girls um, and therefore, and some, these slave girls became the wives. So, um, and they could be, the slaves could be Balinese, uh, Sumatran, from various places, even India. So you had the seed for a very interesting mixed race, uh, multiple communities in all, all these old port towns. So I come from such a family uh, which uh, has this old admixture from the 18th century. My ancestor left China uh, in the late 18th century and married a mixed race Chinese lady. I did a DNA test and I have 10% non-Chinese blood, like many people in my community, uh, indicating very old admixture. Malay was the lingua franca of the region for the last few hundred years. It is like English today. Uh, it was spoken right across the region. So we are often mistaken for being half Malay, cult, but it's, Malay was the culture of the cosmopolitan culture of the region. So we really have to understand that. Um, if you go to the museum or please visit National University of Singapore's Baba House, it's a house museum on Neil Road. If everybody has time, you, you, you get a little introduction into that culture. Uh, one of your first impressions of Singapore is how uh, multicultural it is and you have people from all kinds of communities. I cannot stress how um, kind of deregulated that concept is because you might think of it simply as we are 70% uh, Chinese, 20% Malay or you know 10% uh, Indian but within each group we are so diverse so even being southern Chinese uh, 
uh, we are not monocultural even within our sectors. The Indian community could comprise people from Tamil Nadu, from Kerala. Uh, my family, we are from Fujian province, but there are also Cantonese from Guangdong, and there are just so many languages, kinds of foods, which you would have experienced going to, a, let's say, a hawker center, where Chinese food is just uh, coming from so many different villages and, and areas, and it's all a mishmash. So in Singapore, we have lived for hundreds of years without a concept of anything being right or normal. Today, my talk, Dressing Badly in the Ports, is to look at how uh, look at history through dress and to think a bit about looking at history through the idea of fashion. Now fashion, well especially if you think coming from France, the French idea of fashion, uh, it's still very old school. Fashion is top down, it's imposed by elites uh, and it's about what you must have, you, you know, how to dress properly, the, the whole, whole idea of correct dress. If you think about that from a historian's point of view, that is almost like the most boring way to, to look at history or look at the past. Uh, and why do I say that? Imagine if you were to study the history of Singapore, or let's say drug culture in Singapore, through our regulations, you would have a completely false idea of, of what life is like here. The rules say, of course, it's a death penalty, uh, but maybe some of you will eventually come to see it is still a huge problem, you know, uh, drugs really exist in Singapore. Uh, so if you study it through just the rules and regulation, as you would fashion, you'd have a completely false idea. So again, in your studies, I would just caution you to, to look at societies only through customs and laws or what is, what are regulations. Uh, and when we look at this, uh, I'm trying to uncover even what we think of between dress and identity, and identity as, as something, and dress as something enforced upon communities. And how real, how old uh, would these concepts be? Um, Anthony Reid is, is uh, you can look him up, he's a very good historian of Southeast Asia. Um, he brought up a very interesting thing about dress, that in Southeast Asia, unlike in Europe, um, it was really hard to distinguish class and uh, status through dress because nobody uh, abided by sumptuary laws. So uh, whether you were a peasant or a king, you could even look alike. Um, the, of course, there were dress regulations, but these were often flouted. So that is one characteristic of Southeast Asia. It's this sort of deregulation of how people dressed. Um, and throughout the 15th and 16th centuries, he noted that people very much experimented with the way they dressed. The other big issue is the circulation of textiles and garments in the area. Uh, Southeast Asia is you know, a huge sort of crossroads. So what is really fascinating is that for the last four or five hundred years, we have not only produced our own fabulous textiles and fashions, uh, but textiles from all over the world have come through uh, our oceans and, 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 and ports, meaning uh, we had the best of what was produced in China, in Europe, in India. And we've had these for a few hundred years. So we are mind-bogglingly diverse and we've been global way before the word even became fashionable. The other important thing to think about, which is often neglected, is the idea of secondary markets. Things circulated, so something might be made in Europe and have a certain context. It might be shipped and used in a completely context in a little community in Java. The thing might be so precious, it might be resold to a person in, from the Indian community and have another function in use. So objects move from community to community if they're valuable and their meaning keeps changing. And when we look at art history, art history, we tend to just focus on who made them and who the first patron was. And we often ignore how these histories carry on over the centuries. Um, and so these are some of the considerations. I bring up the idea of badly dressing because as you will all know, even now in social media, how people hate if uh, somebody's not 
dressed properly or correctly. Um, it's interesting how the internet's been freed up um, with social media, but yet we see these very kind of reactionary, old school thinking um, coming in, imposing on, on and, and criticizing people. Um, I, with my talk, I also want to challenge the idea that there was any such thing as a traditional dress in Southeast Asia. Um, we have this ongoing dichotomy between global fashion, which is sort of started in France, and the rest of the world we call, you know, ethnic costume. Um, and I would like to suggest that we break away from looking at the way we dress uh, in this um, kind of strange way. I would say Asians have bought into this idea of this difference between uh, fashion and ethnic costume. Uh, and I hope by the end of this talk we can see that everything is more complex than we imagined. Um, and then we have, you know, despite all this diversity, you also have this um, interesting global trend, which is as much as people want to be different or, or dress randomly, people also want the same thing. I mean, for example, look at how, you know, the success of the MS handbag. Uh, it's become a global thing wherever you are, you know, every kind of a despotic nation, especially in Southeast Asia, you go to <laughs> certain places, you know, all the wealthy ladies, each one's carrying their crocodile MS handbag. And um, you see that all over from Africa to, you know, it's the third world rich persons must have. So as much as the, you have the diversity, you have this sort of desire to just have what everybody else has. Um, so yeah, the, the big themes here for um, of this presentation is the idea of the globalizing West versus traditional Asia, uh, Western fashion versus traditional Asian dress or costume, and even the idea, is there such a thing as hybrid and pure? Do we read, does this dichotomy actually exist? Um, one big thing about uh, dressing up in Southeast Asia is of course showing off. And what we find, okay, this is a, a, an illustration of a mixed race lady in Goa. Goa was established by the Portuguese as a colonial port in the early 16th century. And what you had is, what you had there was this sort of first cowboy town, I call it, because it was where you had this real first globalized city, East meets West. And these so-called wealthy Portuguese ladies, they were probably all quite like uh, mixed with Indian blood. Um, you see this sort of breaking away from convention because it, this was out in the colonies. You were less regulated um, as you would be back home. So women dressed above their station. They spent a lot of money on clothes, uh, you know, um, beyond what would have been considered appropriate for their class. Um, this is a very interesting description of how, you know, Portuguese ladies would go to church in Goa um, and how they put on very costly clothing and gold bracelets and bands in their arms and gemstones and pearls. Um, so going to church in Goa became this incredible opportunity for everyone to just show off. Uh, bearing in mind, in Europe at that time, uh, and, and places like in China, sumptuary laws were very strictly enforced. So you could get executed or sent to jail if you wore jewellery beyond that was too expensive or beyond your station or your rank or whatever. So here we see this sort of uh, kind of disorder creeping into so-called overseas European societies in Goa. Um, this is a very lovely portrait of the Knoll family. Uh, he, the husband here was a, was a Dutch merchant in Hirado. And this is, uh, you, if you go to the Rijksmuseum in, in, in Amsterdam, you'll see this painting, it's up there all the time. Uh, and he married, uh, 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 his wife here uh, was half Japanese. Her mother was a geisha. Uh, her father was a very wealthy Dutch businessman. He, she, uh, she, married her husband who, who was the leading merchant in Batavia, Jakarta. And they were one of the leading sort of the David Beckham and Vic, David and Victoria Beckham of their time, very fashionable. And here you can see she has, you know, expensive jewelry from 17th century, 
They have all the luxury goods like uh, ivory boxes. He's got gold buttons, um, you know, extravagant fans, and, um, and he was just showing off all the, the sort of wealth and luxury at that time. And she uh, was born in Hirado, she lived in Jakarta or Batavia, and she died in the Netherlands. Uh, this is an example of the kind of global hybrid mixed race person of the 17th century. Um, and interestingly, this is a letter she wrote, which still survives uh, in her family. Uh, she, could, she was literate in Japanese and in Dutch, and she spoke Malay as well. And it is, interestingly, a gift of Indian textiles made to her mother. So it just shows you how globalized uh, people were already at that time and how much they spent money on jewelry and, and valuable uh, luxuries. This is a wonderful uh, painting now in um, Krakow, in Poland. Uh, I'm not sure how it ended up there, but it shows the Sultan of Tidor. So Tidor is one of the Spice Islands. Um, and here he is wearing this wonderful um, chintz, or what in, in French you say, andien, the sort of um, these very luxurious Indian dyed cottons made in the Coromandel Coast in South India that was traded all over the world. And look at how he's just, you know, got his own style, you know, his gold bangles in his um, hair and a headband. Um, and sort of like all this gold jewelry with an Indian jacket. So it's this sort of flamboyance you see in Southeast Asia in the 17th century. And then this went right on to the 20th century. And here I just wanted to show you this rather extravagant, really kind of fierce. She looks like a boxer, but she was one of the wealthiest uh, ladies in Singapore in the late 19th century. And she's wearing these enormous gold and diamond brooches, which she has on her own. Uh, commission, so it's her own style. Uh, and th these are the initials of her name. Her name is Ho Sok Chu, so it's H-S, there'll be a C below here. Um, and so what is interesting is like, while in France, uh, all you poor French were subjected to the style and of the elite, and um, people had to dress according to their class, and um, were restricted by what was considered in style and had to be dressed properly. In Southeast Asia, it was totally crazy and you could say she's badly dressed, she's just putting on whatever she likes. There was no court in Singapore. We had so many little communities, so everybody was their own Christian Dior. Uh, so here we have this interesting kind of self-determination about how people want to dress. Uh, it is a completely different paradigm about fashion. Um, in the Sajara Malayu, which is uh, one of the classics of Malay history, I think this is a very interesting description of how, uh, you know, sort of a dandy would be dressing up. He would don his sarong, he would, un he would undo it 12 or 13 times until he got it to his liking. Then would come the jacket and headcloth, and the process with the sarong would be repeated with them until they were to his liking. So uh, the idea that people just love to dress up and the sort of vanity and experimentation was so much part of um, culture. Um, and here in another description by Munshi Abdullah, who was one of the first modern Malay writers in, of the mid 19th century. Um, here he also observes that people, you know, even what he calls um, um, people who just loafed about, that, that in, in, in Malaysia were all kind of like really just dressed up and looking like dandies. Um, the other interesting aspect, apart from showing off, was the how people mix and matched because, as I mentioned, um, luxury goods came, and, or just goods, all kinds of goods came from all over the world. And um, these illustrations are from um, an 18th century album in Nagasaki from the Matsura Historical Museum documenting foreigners who were in Japan at that time. And again, here we have these very curiously dressed people. He's wearing an andien or chintz jacket, uh, smoking a Dutch pipe with a sort of a bowler hat and bloomers. And this is a strange sort of hodgepodge of uh, Western fashion. I mean, badly dressed, but it's his own style. Uh, a kafir, it says kafir jin. Um, 
He's also got a fashionable chintz jacket, but you know, he's matched it with a loincloth. And similarly, we have here a Chinese man who is not wearing his trousers. He's wearing leggings instead. So this is not something you would see in China itself, or what we understand as fashion that was documented at the time. So people in the past often, you know, we call this sort of Pirates of the Caribbean style, but um, I would say that it was probably much more prevalent than we imagine. Uh, these were people who did not conform to the strict dress codes. Uh, and here also a native of Goa, and I think he's looking very fashionable uh, in his own way. Uh, he's not fashionable in, in the French meaning of the word for that period, but look, you know, he's gone on a lovely waistcoat. He's used a scarf as a belt, the headband. Uh, this is a really chic uh, man from Goa. Um, and here we have another illustration from um, the late 18th century in Batavia or Jakarta. This European child is wearing a Chinese bib, a baby's bib, underneath his Western coat. And here we have a wedding in Jakarta. And of course, there are ladies here on the left lining uh, the wall uh, in the contemporary French fashions of the period. But you will see a lady dressed in this sort of very interesting mixed Batavian style, like this lady as well. Um, and how you can see that dress regulations were not so strictly enforced, or they were less important even in so-called European societies in, 18th, in the 18th century. Um, and here you have a detail of this lady. So she's wearing a long kabaya with a chin so andien skirt. And this was considered appropriate enough for a wedding. The bride is here, her, her mother probably, uh, in, in this sort of mixed hybrid fashion. Uh, and then here we have a Chinese bride of Batavia and she's got on a Chinese skirt, a Malay top and jewelry from all over Southeast Asia. Um, and although this might look to you like a very typical Chinese uh, lady. Uh, interestingly, the material of her Chinese top is made from European flock velvet, and she has on uh, only European jewelry. And this is something you would not see in China at that time. Um, and more examples of how people mixed up. This is a sort of a Filipino gentleman um, in sort of new styles. And also the sort of deregulation in fashion, I'd just like to point out here, um, nobody is dressed in the same way. Um, in Europe and Japan or China at the same time, of course, with dress regulation, you had this I idea of fashion as uniform. Um, people had to wear the right suit and the so-called penguin look. Everybody would be looking the same, but this, you, you see this real hodgepodge. Uh, the sultan, or, or the, the main ruler here is in a Chinese brocade, and they are wearing variations of Turkish, Indian, uh, and Islamic um, costumes. So it's this, and even the headgear is on in, in tied in very different ways. So you see this wonderful sort of um, mixture and diversity in the way people dressed. Uh, again, this is, uh, and you even see this in, in Thailand, where the Queen of Thailand. A queen of Siam is dressed with the, in, in a Thai style uh, sort of a skirt folded up with a fashionable 19th century sort of what we call leg of mutton European dress. And we see the same kind of blouse underneath this sari here. Um, and again, this Malay lady, but what is she wearing? A sort of French lace uh, veil. So. Uh, and just endless examples of how people mix and match. Again, this is a, a row of Malay dignitaries, but um, they're all dressed in different ways. Um, and interestingly, even for this Japanese lady, where, okay, in the late, if you study late um, Edo, late 19th century Japanese history, Japanese fashion was also following the European style, very heavily regulated. But in Singapore, this Japanese lady has chosen to wear Puranakan or Malay style footwear, and she's pinned on brooches here in a way that was considered very, very 
unconventional and incorrect uh, for Japanese ladies in Japan. And similarly here, uh, a Japanese, she's a geisha, but a Japanese geisha would never allow herself to be photographed without her socks or footwear. And here she's just barefoot. Uh, and here we see this sort of continuing kind of diversity. Um, the gentlemen here are wearing Chinese shoes. He's got on Western shoes. Uh, they've got on a whole, he's wearing a boater. Um, and, and they've got different kinds of um, headgear. So a lot of diversity, as I mentioned. The ladies of this family, interestingly enough, are all dressed in completely different styles, completely different styles. Um, you don't even see that today when... The, 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 the interesting thing is, um, today, when people, like for example, if a Chinese or Indian family decides to dress in their traditional costume, it has to be so correct and everybody does it in exactly the same way. Um, everybody has to dress in the kind of very uniform style, while in fact, when we looked in the past, if you look in the past, Asian dress was not traditional, it was very experimental and free, as in how these ladies are. She's got on la a lacy, kind of more Chinese-inspired dress. She's got a lace-inspired, kind of more Malay-style dress. And she's got on a, an older-style dress, but it's using modern European printed cotton. It's a real hodgepodge, and even the gentlemen are all in different styles. Um, what, what's interesting is, of course, uh, the comments from uh, travellers of that time uh, were observing this kind of... Of course, ethnic dress was really frowned upon by European observers. It was described as unbecoming. European women wearing Asian clothes were described as being wearing the strangest clothes since Eden. And for Peranakan women to wear non-Chinese fashion, um, this was described as wearing bastard garments. I mean, at the turn of the 20th century, in the age of imperialism and racism, it was very important for everyone to conform. Uh, and that's when race and identity and dress all became intertwined. And um, so rather than being something new, this idea of racial purity, fashion and identity, in fact, is quite a modern construct. So with this presentation, what I'm trying to reha rehabilitate is the idea of Asian fashion, not tradition. Rehabilitating the idea of the impure that we have been mixing and, ma mixing and matching and throwing things together since time immemorial. Uh, that f in Asia, we need to reconcile tradition and modernity that rather as something as separate, it's something integrated and has been ongoing. And I would also like to raise the inherent possibility of disorder and deregulation in how communities form, in how we dress, and how we accept each other. Um, and, and ultimately, I think, therefore, dressing badly is the only way to dress well. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, so, here's the prepared equations. Um, so, um, I thought that maybe some of you want to stay there, see, or if you want to join on stage, it's really up to you. Uh, where are the students? They prepare it. Thank you for your talk, I'm David. Hi. Um, you said that in Asia, uh, the clothes weren't representing the statues of the, of the person. But do you think uh, today is the same case? Because today a lot of people are, are dressed West in a Western way in Asia. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I think this is part of the problem because by when at the turn of, in the late 19th century, 
um, there was a lot of anxiety among Asian communities because, I mean, we're talking about, the, you know, this age of imperialism. It was also when racism was really kind of peaked uh, in global, in sort of a global cultural context. So what, it, it, how it, the response in dress was for people to um, kind of over articulate their identity. And one of the outcomes of this was that dress became much more regulated in Asian societies. So what we started to witness in Pranakan society, for example, was that uh, there were social reformers who were telling you know, members of our community, you are Chinese, so don't dress in bastard garments, dress properly as a Chinese. And he would go on to uh, establish what he would consider as a proper way to dress as a Chinese. So this kind of thinking affected every Asian community. So from the 20th century, we see this growing regulation of how you look and how um, dress and identity had to be linked. We also start seeing the idea of traditional costume, which came perhaps as a Western idea, but Asians just suddenly bought into the same idea. So we believed, we started to believe this idea as well. So right now, in fact, we have thrown away all this idea that uh, fashion ever existed in Asia. And Asian families are actually much more conservative now than they've ever been in the past. So, for example, uh, at Chinese New Year, you will see a Chinese family, they might, the whole family might decide to, oh, let's all wear the Cheong Sam and, and the Chinese garments. And everybody would kind of look the same. And the same for Malay families at Hari Raya or Indian families, they would tie the saris all in exactly the same way. Uh, Malay families, they would also dress in the same kind of, you know, same colours and everything is much more regulated and uniform now. While and you look in the, in the past, it was just mayhem and people just wore what they liked and it was fine. So in fact, we've reinvented the idea of tradition uh, and we've forgotten and people don't realise that it's, it's not even 100 years old and that these pictures and, and paintings reveal how, how uh, people had much more freedom in the way they dressed. So yeah, I would say it's, it's, it's a huge problem. And what I try to do with this sort of presentation is to rehabilitate because there's too much of that dichotomy and we believe it ourselves. And I think in Europe, the problem, if you go to any museum exhibition, I give you an example. We did a Pranakan exhibition at the Musée K. Bronley. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah. Uh, the curators there, I understand, really hated it. Why did they hate a Pranakan exhibition in Paris? Tell you why. Because the Musée K. Bronley, of course, if you've been, has exoticized Africa. It's African mask. It's, you know, it's everything exotic. We brought a show that had lace, that had sort of uh, things which they associate, the curators might have associated with what their grandmother wore, kind of frou-frou, bourgeois, European fashion mixed up in Asia, which they thought was the worst thing you could do at the Musée Quai Bonli. But I think that is because their minds have really split France and the rest of the world. So the Musée Quai Bonli has to be exoticized. And it's not really seeing the history of the world as, as, as kind of a seamless, connected space. It's really trying to separate everything into neat, uh, separate sort of spheres. So, you know, we, we, we are partly, pro you know, it's a big problem that we have inherited culturally, globally, uh, how we just sort of continue to, to, to carry on these 19th century ideas, especially with fashion, because the, if, you, if you open any fashion magazine or, or blog, it's what you must wear, you know, the latest you must have. Uh, the language of fashion is still dictatorial. It's what uh, Roland Barthes called the tyranny of fashion. So you, you can still see it playing out today. It's a, very, uh, it's a very good point, actually, because I went to the exhibition class many years ago, I guess, something like that, the Game of Only, and I was wondering why it was not that music event. <laughs> One with more um, you know, used to have kind of exhibition. So I was a bit um, confused about why I came only 
And uh, I, I want to jump into that because actually in France, as uh, well as in Europe, but I have an example in France that a lot of fashion designers, they use African textile and they want to use this kind of textiles for fashion, for new, you know, new clothes and so on. And that was interesting to me for this theme of the week, which is transition, which is a transition of traditional African uh, some costume, but traditional uh, clothes, and they use this kind of textiles in order to have more fashion clothes. So it's, it's, it's like a transition from the previous one to the new, the new way to wear things. And I was wondering why we don't see that, I, I don't know maybe I'm going to say, I don't know, but uh, why we don't see that so much in Singapore as well as the rest of Asia, that they don't use so much traditional costume to reappropriate those yeah. You know, that is such an interesting and very contentious issue at the moment among fashion scholars. Uh, it's very touchy because um, there's a whole issue about appropriation. Uh, I personally don't subscribe to it, but there, is, there are some scholars who really, they're called the decolonializing scholar. This whole issue of you can look it up, decol the decolonial. But uh, the idea that communities need to reclaim what was stolen. So all this appropriation by European fashion of eth ethnic dress, um, some people are just so against this idea. But I personally have a completely different view and I think as you see from this presentation, this kind of so-called appropriation has been happening since time immemorial. You just take whatever you like and you, you kind of um, use bits and pieces of whatever you want. But unfortunately, this issue is so fraught with the idea of colonial history, uh, of exploitation, of, uh, of small communities. So historians from these other communities are reacting against this very idea. How dare you take what is traditionally mine and just commercialize it for the season. So this is a very tricky area. It, there isn't a, a simple answer to it. It's still fraught with very emotional issues for scholars, especially from these other communities, how, you know, uh, they, f how they feel sort of, you know, it's a history of exploitation. Uh, it's equated with that. And coming from a Pranakan community, I, I, I react to this very differently because being Pranakan and Chinese, we are both exploiter and exploited. So, you know, it's very strange. We, we are so hybrid that we even historically have been both. We, we have collaborated with the colonial governments to exploit for financial benefit. We have also been exploited ourselves. Uh, even within our own community, sometimes uh, this issue has come up, you know, the, you know about colonialization as Europe, uh, the Europe's exploitation of, of, of Southeast Asia, let's say. Uh, but quite often I found, strangely enough, that the worst cases of exploitation are actually within our own communities. If I were to recall stories within my own community, uh, the most cruel thing somebody did to somebody else was usually, let's say, something my grandfather did to my uncle or my, you know, it, it just sort of happened within communities and quite often uh, decolonial historians tend to look for blame in among the colonialists, but it's much more complex at that, like, than that. So before we really understand this issue, we need to not only give shade to, you know, uh, allow the different, sh the hundred shades of uh, of uh, Asian society, but we also need, of the, or exploited societies, we also need to allow the hundred shades of colonial society. So, um, I mean, going forward, we, we, we need to, to rethink these two ideas and recolor them, um, and so that they're just not too kind of uh, two dimensional, or let's say one, a flat dimensional perspective of, of, of Europe and Asia, and how do we look at you know, the, the sort of global history. And while you are here and, you know, I'm sure you will be experiencing that on a, on a daily basis because you are seeing things that are so familiar yet are strangely alien and you're not really sure if you're understanding uh, 
you know, you can understand what everyone is saying, yet everything is so strange. And, you know, how, how are you processing the, the, the exotic and the internal, you know? And a lot of it is actually just historical conditioning. Uh, you will find that you will just naturally like or dislike a lot of things that, and each of you will, might have a completely different um, take on it. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, any questions? Yes. Hello. Uh, Hello. Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you think Singaporean people are losing their identity in today's world uh, with the recent fashion and more globally uh, in the world with the globalization and distributing fiction? Um, I think, strangely enough, I think um, we have been living in Southeast Asia and it, especially for our history here, we've been, you know, if you look at these pictures, people have been doing all kinds of things and determining for themselves how they want to dress. So I think uh, what I'm saying is that if we try and break away, what, why it still remains separate is because we can't integrate the two. Uh, we still see that there's a need to be traditional and then the need to be uh, global. We don't realize that they're all the same thing. So in a certain sense, we are losing it because we have petrified the idea of Asian dress into this impractical thing that maybe we wear once a year for our Chinese New Year or whatever religious ceremony, and then the rest of the time we, we dress in a different way. Um, I think that is a problem, but to be honest, I think it really doesn't matter to me. I mean, and, and now, um, you know, we, we, we sort of evolve in a different way. Today, I tried to be kind of silly. I just wore some silly clothes anyway, just uh, to sort of, uh, at least to um, put m my money where my mouth is. And, and, um, but I, th I think it's evolving. It's becoming interesting and it's changing. But I mean, but at the end of the day, how can we fight against Uniqlo and Muji when it's just so cheap and everybody just so comfortable, you know? So, um, but this is a call for this integration. So uh, your first question again was. The question is, uh, how is the Singaporean uh, identity in fashion is built uh, yeah. out of maybe Chinese fashion, Indian fashion, and Malaysian fashion? Yeah. Well, but I, as in today. Yeah. yeah. Well, firstly, I kind of anti the idea of identity. I think it's it's a nineteenth century <laughs> construct. That uh, I mean, put it this way: within my family, none of us are the same. We don't even like the same things, and we are always arguing about what is better or what is worse. I mean, why do we pretend to imagine that societies feel the same way? I mean, we're not amoeba. We, 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 we are just so diverse and inconsistent. So the idea of identity is a fiction because we, all, we can pretend to all like the same things. If you, if you want to say that, I mean, to me, that's what identity is. You know. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we, we are actually so diverse and I, I'm, I'm very careful to, to articulate identity because when you do that, you just bully the people who don't conform to that idea of what you think or what the general consensus think is identity. It's, it's a political construct, mostly, and a power construct. Uh, and, but Going back to that question, yes, we still have communities, um, but as I, I spoke earlier, we are still 
we are still suffering the fallout of the era of nationalism, racism, you know, where in the 20th century, dress was used as a way to define identity, right? So this has been trained in us. I mean, you talk about Chinese identity. The Cheong Sam is Manchurian. The origin is not Chinese. Um, but it was used as a kind of nationalistic idea. But that's the thing. If you look at any national costume, it's mostly hybrid. Yeah. <coughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, sorry, and then, yeah, well, let, let's go to this question. So the uh, Malay was a lingua franca even in Batavia. So Batavia is Jakarta today, as, a, as I mentioned, and it was the language spoken by everyone. So it would have been very likely that um, they spoke, they were all Malay speaking. It literally functioned like English. So it, People spoke it at home, they s spoke it to members of other communities. It, it was uh, lingua franca. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. It, it was a local and international language. It, you could speak it throughout island Southeast Asia, anywhere um, in the Indonesian islands. Um, it was even understood in parts of India, in the ports, and even in Africa. I mean, there were people. And, there's a, an account of a British seaman in the 17th century who got, uh, he was in a shipwreck and he ended up on the China coast. And when he was there, he found somebody who could speak Malay. So, um, because in the China coast, there were many people who were going up and down for trade. So he even managed to find someone who could speak Malay in the China coast. So that's how international Malay was at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.